Well, hi everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. I have to take a week off and go to Antarctica to squeegee the dome as part of my public service. So I hope you'll enjoy this remastered version of Mark Sargent, Flat Earth Clues, Episode 2, Bird and Antarctica. I was, and still am, a huge conspiracy guy. I literally ran out of new tin hat topics to research, and I still wouldn't look at this one without embarrassment. But every time I glanced at it, there was something unresolved. Clues, part two, the bird wall. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in, and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue revolves around one of the most remarkable men you may have never heard of, Richard E. Byrd, and his relationship with Antarctica, and the secretive missions he carried out there until his dying day. Admiral Byrd was quite a guy. It's a little known fact that in later life he was confined to a wheelchair, not because he couldn't walk, but because doctors were afraid that he would trip over his own awesomeness and break a hip. The first large-scale mission was an expedition to Antarctica in 1928. This was noteworthy, because even though he had just flown over the North Pole in 1926, all expeditions from 1928 on were focused on the South. His second Antarctic expedition ran from 1933 to 1935, and his third from 39 to 40. He then helped lead U.S. Navy fleet operations in World War II, was present during the Japanese surrender in 1945, but then something strange happened. He went back to Antarctica. You know, that's a very strange assertion, Mark. Why would the United States send its most experienced Antarctic explorer back to Antarctica? Personally, if I was President Truman or the Secretary of the Navy, I kind of think that Admiral Byrd would be the guy I'd send. His fourth trip to Antarctica wasn't an expedition. It was a military operation called Operation High Jump commanding an entire aircraft carrier group that included 13 support ships, Admiral Byrd led 4,700 men to the South Pole for reasons that are still shrouded to this day. Now this is Operation High Jump, the military expedition to Antarctica following the Second World War. Admiral Richard Byrd participated in this expedition. Now, two things that I want to point out. Uh, at the 6 o'clock position on the Antarctic continent is something called Little America. That was the base of operations for this expedition. The second thing that I want to point out and draw your attention to is the Antarctic Peninsula at the 10 o'clock position and note its proximity to the tip of South America. What we do know is that the U.S. had sent an excessively large military force to the ice, all under the guise of peaceful intentions. During this operation, Admiral Byrd told a Chile newspaper this, The most important result of his observations and discoveries is the potential effect that they have in relation to the security of the United States. After the operation, Admiral Byrd toured the states and gave interviews, the most interesting of which is a national television show in 1954. During this television interview, he first spoke of an area beyond the South Pole as large as the United States, which no one had set foot on yet. He then went on to say that there would probably be expeditions year after year because the U.S. government had really become interested. The interviewers then probed as to why the interest in the South, when any perceived military threat from Russia, keep in mind this was 1954, would be from the North. Now I'm going to address both these issues. The first thing is something that the flat earth community likes to talk about and that is this great unexplored area the size of the United States beyond the pole. Now the implication seems to be that this is some sort of a secret location only known to the powers that be. But if you go back to the actual interview and listen very carefully to what Admiral Byrd said. He said that if you leave Little America, which is at the six o'clock position here, and go past the South Pole, there is an area the size of the United States that no man has ever been to. He's referring to everything above the South Pole on this map. There's nothing at all sinister about this, but in the mid-1950s, we hadn't been there very much. It's a large sheet of ice. It hadn't been thoroughly explored. 
this is something that a young man with a sense of adventure could go look at, which was his response to the question that he was directly asked. Now, why would the United States be interested in the South Pole from a military aspect? I don't think that this is a question that has been thought through very thoroughly by most people in the Flat Earth community. So I'm going to lay it out to you and let you see it. Now, the distance between the Southern Horn of Africa and Antarctica is over 2,000 miles. Now, this is the main passage between the Indian Ocean and the South Atlantic. It's very wide, it's very difficult to control, and trade and warships can travel through this rather freely. Now, let's have a look at the South Pacific. Here is the passage between Australia slash New Zealand and the South Pole. Again, this would be a very difficult passage to control militarily. So both south of Africa and south of Australia and New Zealand are pretty much open. They are not what we call choke points, but that is not the case here. This is the passage between the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific. It's very narrow. There are only two passages between the Atlantic and the Pacific. One is the Panama Canal, which is a very high value target. The other is the choke point between the southern tip of South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. Now I want you to think about the time that Admiral Byrd gave that interview. It was the height of the Cold War. If there was a Russian naval base on the Antarctic Peninsula trying to control that strait, that is a flashpoint for war. If the countries of the world, especially the major powers of the world, had tried to carve up Antarctica for its resources, that could have been the tinder that started World War III. And as a result, the United States conducted Operation High Jump to show that it could extend its power to that continent. He went on to say that it was the most valuable and important place in the world for science. It involved the future of the nation, an untouched reservoir of untapped resources, including coal, oil, minerals, and uranium. He added that at the time of the interview, there were seven nations currently engaged in Antarctica including Russia, Australia, Argentina, Chile, and New Zealand. During the interview, the Admiral talked about planning the next military mission to Antarctica. It was called Operation Deep Freeze and ran from 1955 to 1956. Now this is where you come in and say, so what? And normally I'd agree with you, except for what happened next. Nothing happened next. The missions just suddenly stopped. And that was it. No other expeditions, military or otherwise, were conducted on the continent. Ever. Then a treaty was put in place banning any country from doing basically anything. The end. Okay, right here we're going to need a quick correction. First of all, Operation Deep Freeze continues to this day. There were at least four named missions called Operation Deep Freeze. As a result of these early missions, permanent bases and research centers were established in the South Pole and in Antarctica. These facilities are in existence today and have been in existence continuously since these expeditions in the late 50s. So Mark's assertion that we went down there a couple of times and then suddenly abandoned the entire continent and made it off limits to everybody is simply ludicrous and easily disprovable with even a cursory Google search. And if you're wondering what you're missing, it's this. Admiral Byrd goes on television, says that this massive body of land most of which sits on a plateau two miles high, is rich with every resource you could ever want, energy rich, pristine, with no indigenous population or plant life, and every country that has sent teams is ready to carve it up like a big turkey. Not to mention, there's an expanse of land larger than the United States they haven't even looked at yet. And out of the blue, everyone just calls the whole thing off? Now, I just need to put a stop to this silliness now. We did not abandon Antarctica. We signed an Antarctic Treaty amongst the major powers. The purpose of this treaty is severalfold. 
First, it was to preserve Antarctica for scientific research as part of the geophysical year in 1957 to 1958. It was a cooperative effort on the part of many nations throughout the world to do earth science and basically look at the earth from pole to pole. It was a landmark effort of international scientific cooperation. But wait, there's more. While that was the major purpose stated for the Antarctic Treaty, I suspect, as I have already outlined, that we were facing a potential escalation of military involvement in Antarctica. We were facing the exploitation of resources, and the countries that controlled those resources were not going to give them up, and other countries would have sought to take those resources from them. It was a flashpoint for World War III, and most of the major industrial powers were smart enough to realize that this was a potential problem to world peace just 10 years after World War II had torn the world apart. Like the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, this was an early effort to avoid problems of military conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. Rather than any one country trying to assume control of the continent of Antarctica, we all agreed to use it together for peaceful purposes. And to this day, there are no military bases on Antarctica. And transit between the Antarctic Peninsula and South America is open to all commerce and navies. I'm calling total BS on this one. The dollar value of the initial resources find would have fueled armies of greedy companies. So what happened? They found the edge, that's why. Say what? And now the interior of Antarctica is off limits with no revisions until the year 2041. You can take tours of the outer islands, but there is a hidden line enforced by the military that you will not be able to cross because the interior is actually the exterior edge. It's there, it's hidden, and it's protected. Okay, two quick things here. First of all, I recently put out a video and the link is going to be in the description on a proposed flat earth map. In that video, I demonstrated that this kind of dome is physically impossible given the pattern of star trails. The only possible form of a dome is a spherical dome that goes around the entire earth. And since that dome doesn't touch the earth in any location, you can't find the dome in the South Pole. Now, the other thing that I want to point out is that it's quite possible as a tourist to go to the South Pole. This is only one of many sites. The tickets are $51,250. How many would you like? You can also mount your own expedition down there. You just have certain rules that you have to follow. You bring out what you bring in. You make arrangements for rescue and support. And all it takes is money. Simply having a 10 foil hat and a burning desire for quote unquote the truth and doing your own research doesn't pay your passage to get down to the South Pole. Now another bit of silliness you occasionally hear is that when people actually go to the South Pole, some in the Flat Earth community seem to think that you should be able to walk around that little pole with a compass and have the compass needle swing as you walk around the pole. Now what they fail to understand is that the earth is very large, the magnetic pole is very large, it's not the size of a manhole cover that you just walk around. The other lack of comprehension is that the south pole and the magnetic pole are not at the same location and the magnetic pole moves. Now if you really want to see this effect what I would suggest you do is charter an aircraft. Go to within about 60 miles of the south magnetic pole and fly a circle around it. I suspect the compass would swing. But just quit with this silly straw man that you should be able to walk around a barber pole somewhere and have a compass swing around it. I mean really, Mark. The earth you live on is flat. So do some of your own research and ask questions. Well, I'm going to end this up with that round of questioning that led to this famous quote that is making the rounds in the flat earth community about this unexplored land the size of the United States beyond the pole. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole because it's getting crowded up there now because they find out it's really usable not only to live in but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. 
And there you have it. I encourage everybody to take a moment out of their busy day and go to the internet and learn a little bit about Rear Admiral Richard Byrd. He is truly a remarkable American adventurer and explorer and naval officer. He was, quite frankly, an inspiration to a generation. It disturbs me to see opportunists like this sully his reputation and memory with this nonsense. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you, and please remember to like and subscribe the channel.